So now that we know a little bit about the pressures in the lung and the process of ventilation, we'll talk about the actual air that enters into the lungs and the components of that air. So if we look at the alveolar gas, it is highly humidified because the mucus in the airways of the lungs has a high water content. So that helps to humidify the air. And that's good because it prevents the membranes of the alveoli, the, the respiratory membrane, from drying out, that, that alveolar side of the respiratory membrane. So the, the high amount of water in the mucus is what humidifies that air. And again, we're going to see a lot of oxygen in that inhaled air because it came fresh from the outside. And we're going to see a high amount of carbon dioxide in the alveoli compared to the atmospheric air because the carbon dioxide is being given off as a result of metabolism and is constantly entering the alveoli from the pulmonary capillaries. So in looking at the composition of the air in the lungs, we'll see that in the air of the, in the atmospheric air outside the body, we can see the different percentages of these gases. And if we look in the alveoli, we can see that the alveoli has a higher percentage of water, again, because of the humidification by that mucus lining the airways. We can see there's a higher amount of carbon dioxide because of the constant delivery of carbon dioxide to the lungs from the blood after uh, as a result of metabolism. And then we see that there's lower, uh, a smaller amount of oxygen compared to the outside air because we know that outside air is where we get the oxygen from. So there is a little bit of dilution of the air as it comes into the airways because of the water vapor. So there's a slightly lower oxygen content in the alveoli just because it's diluted by the water vapor. And then some nitrogen. We see a small drop in the nitrogen again because of dilution with the water vapor. Um, but we don't use nitrogen in our body, so that is not going to cross the, the membrane and um, be actively you know, transported throughout the, the blood. So we are going to talk specifically about carbon dioxide and oxygen as the primary gases that are exchanged across the respiratory membrane. And when we talk about partial pressure, we just say that if a, the uh, regular air, mixed air that contains all of these gases, if the, if the pressure of that gas is 760 millimeters of mercury and 6.2% of this amount is water, if I took, did the simple math, 760 times 6.2%, I would get 47 as my answer. So these are just the raw values. We call these the partial pressures, or the PO2 and the PCO2. So again, we're focusing primarily on oxygen and carbon dioxide. So we say PO2, PCO2. So in the alveoli, we see a PO2 of 104 and a, and a PCO2 of 40. And this is the highest place in the body that we're going to find oxygen levels um, of 104 for the PO2, and that's because the oxygen has just come in from the outside air and has not been used by the tissues. So we talked about this exchange across the respiratory membrane. So oxygen is going to leave the alveoli and enter the blood, and carbon dioxide is going to leave the blood and enter the alveoli to be exhaled. What influences that crossing of the respiratory membrane is the pressure gradient. Wherever there's higher pressure on one side of the membrane and lower pressure on the other side, that gas is going to move from high to low pressure. So depending on how steep that difference is in pressure is going to drive that gas across the membrane. And also, each of these gases, carbon dioxide and oxygen, has a solubility coefficient. That is just a value given on that particular molecule's ability to dissolve across the membrane. So that is more of a chemistry concept. We're not going to go into the the, the details of that, but it's important to know that carbon dioxide is uh, readily more readily diffusible across the membrane based on its coefficient of solubility than oxygen is. So what that means is carbon dioxide does not need as steep of a partial pressure gradient to cross the membrane as oxygen does. So oxygen needs a little steeper gradient because it's not quite as soluble across that membrane compared to carbon dioxide. And then we have the concept of ventilation-perfusion coupling. 
And that basically means is perfusion refers to the blood vessels, ventilation refers to the to the alveoli associated with those blood vessels. So the pulmonary capillaries, those that are dilated and actively carrying blood to the alveoli, of course those that are open and blood is flowing through, we're going to see greater exchange across that respiratory membrane just because there's a good blood supply with dilated capillaries and, and um, venules and arterioles that are increasing the perfusion of that portion of the lung tissue. And then the structural characteristics of the respiratory membrane. We already talked about things like fibrosis and fluid that can cause um, structural changes in that respiratory membrane, making it more difficult for carbon dioxide and oxygen to pass through that delicate membrane. So here we see um, an overall diagram representing the flow of gases throughout this body system. So here we see oxygen coming in from the outside air into the alveoli, entering the pulmonary capillaries, then traveling down the pulmonary vein back to the heart, and then distributed to the rest of the body through the aorta, to all the branches of the aorta, and then the oxygen leaves the blood vessels via these systemic capillaries into the tissues. So we're always seeing um, a gradient for oxygen. They're always going to see higher oxygen in the vessels on the arterial side compared to the tissues. So that's always going to promote a movement of oxygen from the blood into the tissues. And we're always going to see carbon dioxide highest in the tissues because that's where it's being produced as a result of metabolism. And that carbon dioxide is going to diffuse from high to low concentration into the blood vessels. So we're always going to see a net diffusion of carbon dioxide from the tissues into the systemic capillaries. So again, in looking at where is the partial pressure of oxygen the highest, it's going to be up here in the alveoli of the lungs because it just came in from the outside air and has not been used by the body yet. And where will we always see the highest PCO2? That's going to be in the tissues, again, because that's where it's being produced. That's where metabolism is occurring that is releasing that carbon dioxide into the interstitial fluid and then into the capillaries. So we can see this drop as we go from the alveoli to the heart. We go from 104 in the alveoli to 100 in the pulmonary veins as it's heading back to the heart. We see just a four millimeter of mercury drop there and that's because the lung tissue itself needs some oxygen to stay alive. So those, those simple squamous alveolar cells are using some of that oxygen just to maintain that the, those cells and keep them alive. So we do see a slight drop there. We don't see a drop as it moves through the heart and on to the systemic arteries because there's nothing using up that oxygen at that point. So we see the, the PO2 is 100 in the pulmonary veins and we see the PO2 is 100 in the arteries because nothing has used up the oxygen. That doesn't happen until we get to the tissue. So this tissue could be the kidneys, the brain, the heart, the digestive tract, the muscles, whatever the tissue that you want to focus on. So we're going to see a drop there as that PO2 leaves the capillaries and enters the tissues. So looking at carbon dioxide, we don't see a significant um, drop again in, in carbon dioxide as we do from the tissues to the blood because it's always going to be higher than 45 millimeters of mercury in the tissues because it's constantly producing that carbon dioxide. And then again that carbon dioxide will travel through the veins um, up to the pulmonary artery and then it's exhaled off into the air. So obviously the air is going to have the lowest amount of carbon dioxide and the highest amount of oxygen because carbon dioxide is a waste product Remember, oxygen is produced by the trees out in the environment. So we have a ready supply of oxygen out in the environment. And there's a nice animation here that summarizes these concepts. Respiration serves as a means for the body to exchange gases with the atmosphere via the blood. The partial pressure of oxygen, PO2, in the air in the alveolar spaces in the lungs is greater than the PO2 in the blood.
so oxygen diffuses into red blood cells from air in the lungs. Also, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, PCO2, in the air in the lungs is less than the PCO2 in the blood. So carbon dioxide diffuses out from red blood cells and into the air in the lungs. Oxygen-rich blood is carried through pulmonary veins to the heart and then pumped through systemic arteries to the body. The PO2 in the blood is higher than the PO2 in the body tissues, so oxygen diffuses out from red blood cells at the body tissues. Also, the PCO2 in the blood is lower than the PCO2 in the body tissues, so carbon dioxide diffuses into red blood cells there. Oxygen-poor blood is carried through systemic veins back to the heart and is pumped through pulmonary arteries to the lungs, where gas exchange again replenishes the blood with oxygen and removes carbon dioxide. So, referring back to this diagram, the key thing to look at is remembering that there's not a big difference as we look at the pulmonary veins to the systemic arteries, but looking at the big drop between the alveoli to the pulmonary veins, arteries, and the tissues. So you're comparing these three major regions. So if I look at oxygen, it's highest in the alveoli, it's dropped slightly in the vessels, and begin continues to drop as I get down into the capillaries and the tissues. So on the PCO2 side of the carbon dioxide, we see it's highest in the tissues. We see it's, um, it's that steady drop from the tissues to the capillaries. So it's greater than 45 here. Then it's 45 as it enters into the vessels. And then it's always going to be slightly lower in the um, alveoli of the lungs because it's constantly being removed by exhale. And it's at its absolute lowest out in the inspired air. So looking at the respiratory membrane, then we already talked about that if we change that membrane, it becomes filled with water because of pneumonia or um, excess fluid because of heart failure. That's where the word edematous comes from. It just means that there's fluid around the lungs, maybe because of heart failure and too much fluid in the vessels. Um, gas exchange is going to be impaired because of that. So we're going to start to see an, an increase in the PCO2 in the vessels because it cannot get out of the blood and cross into the alveoli. So anytime there's something wrong with the heart and it's pumping action, that is going to cause too much blood to remain in the heart and enters the vessels and that fluid will leak out. And that fluid can leak around the outside of the lung and that's going to prevent that respiratory membrane from effectively um, taking carbon dioxide from the blood and um, entering into the carb into the alveoli to be exhaled. We also talked about emphysema, how that is uh, results in a breakdown of the alveoli. So those simple squamous cells simply break down and there is no respiratory membrane. And as a result, again, the carbon dioxide gets trapped in the lung tissue, but there's no um, elasticity of that lung tissue because there is not any um, simple squamous cells that will ex um, expand and relax with normal inhalation and exhalation. And again, that's going to impair gas exchange if there is no surface area for gas exchange. So talking about this internal respiration, remember that's between the blood and the tissues. And we talked about that the, the oxygen in the tissues is always going to be lower than the blood because the tissues use the oxygen. So they're absorbing that oxygen that is delivered via the arteries. And when we look at the PO2 of the blood in the veins and compare that to the PCO2, we're going to see an increase in the PCO2 in the venous blood because that has been added to the veins from the tissues. So that's going to be a higher value. And again, the the PO2 of the venous blood is going to be at its lowest point because that is where the, um, the blood is deficient of oxygen and needs to come back to the lungs to be oxygenated once again. So looking here, we can see PO2 in the veins here is lower, and as it comes up into the alveoli, then again, that is new oxygen is freshly added, and then we see an increase on the arterial side of this capillary bed where it's going to have 100 millimeters of mercury.
So we've added oxygen to make up for the loss of oxygen that occurred down here in the tissues. So looking at how oxygen and carbon dioxide are transported in the blood, there's a number of ways that we transport oxygen and carbon dioxide, and each of them differs a little bit in the primary mode of transport. So when we look at oxygen, oxygen is mostly carried bound to hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein that has a very unique shape, and four oxygen molecules can bind to one hemoglobin. So this is an important carrier of oxygen. And when we do an O2 sat on an individual, when you put that on their fingertip and you get that measurement 95% to 100, that's measuring how much of the hemoglobin molecules in that blood have bound oxygen, which means they're fully bound. So if we have 100% um, oxygen saturation, we know that all of the hemoglobin is bound with oxygen. So that's an important um, means of transport because when we have fully bound hemoglobin and there's some temporary loss of oxygenation happening in the lungs, we're going to have a little bit of time as that oxygen unloads from hemoglobin and serves our living tissues. So we have just a few minutes before all that oxygen will be depleted, but that does give us a little time at least to correct the problem. That's why it's so important that when the heart stops and breathing stops that we you know, stop the choking, perform the Heimlich maneuver, give CPR because we only have a few minutes before all that oxygen will be unloaded from the hemoglobin and then the tissues are de de deprived of oxygen and start to die. A small percent is dissolved in the plasma. So oxygen, some oxygen molecules as they enter the alveoli and then into the pulmonary capillary in the blood, the capillaries, they don't bind hemoglobin, they're simply dissolved in the plasma. So they're freely found in that interstitial fluid of the blood, just dissolved in that fluid. So what we find is when the tissues are metabolically active, we see a propensity of unloading from hemoglobin. So when oxygen is released into the tissues, that changes the affinity or the attraction between hemoglobin and oxygen. So if, the, if oxygen is needed by the tissues, we find that the molecular affinity or the attraction of hemoglobin to oxygen decreases. So that's simply going to promote more unloading. So it's basically promoting the unloading of oxygen um, into the tissues. And on the other side, when we're resting and we have excess um, oxygen, we find that there's a per, there's an increased affinity for oxygen to bind to hemoglobin. So that way, we are always maximally saturated um, when our when, when we're resting and hemoglobin when it's able to pick up excess oxygen like when we're breathing and, and sitting in a chair, it's going to do that effectively and continue to bind until it's full. So if we look at the curve that describes the relationship between saturation of hemoglobin and the PO2, we see it's not a straight curve, but an S-shaped curve. And what this shows is that when we're resting and the PO2 is about 40 millimeters of mercury, we can see that we're about 75% saturated. But when you get up here into the, the 60 millimeter of mercury for PO2, we're 90% we're saturated, which is a healthy place to be. And what this basically indicates is that when the PO2 changes by a small amount, we don't see a big drop in our oxygen saturations. For example, if we go from a PO2 of, of 100 to 80, we see a very slight drop in the oxygen saturation. It's not until we see a big drop in PO2, say going from 40 to 20, that we see this big unloading of oxygen. So what this means is if we look at some curves here, we can see that there's a relationship of moving the curve to the left or to the right. So if we look at this diagram here, we can see the dark red and uh, the, the blue are different shifts of this normal hemoglobin oxid, uh, saturation curve. So if I look at an increase in temperature, say with exercise, that an increase in body temperature means we have more metabolic activity. The oxygen needs of the body is going to rise. As a result, we see a sh shift of that curve to the right. 
which means that we're going to have more unloading of oxygen to the tissues. On the other side, we see a left shift of this curve when we um, have lower body temperature, less need for oxygen unloading, so we see a left shift. So anything that is going to increase oxygen demands is going to cause a right shift of this dissociation curve. Um, left shift would be anything that's going to promote the loading of oxygen onto hemoglobin. So like we said here in the example of a decreased temperature, less metabolic activity, less need for oxygen. So other things that are going to cause a right shift would be um, pH. When we have a low pH environment, for example, if we have increased PCO2 because the lungs are not blowing off oxygen, or we have a metabolic acidosis because, because of an increase in lactic acid, or maybe some keto acids from someone who has um, type 1 diabetes, anything that causes a decline in the blood pH is going to weaken that hemoglobin oxygen bond and we're going to see an unloading of oxygen to the tissues. So that is a, another example of a right shift of this curve which is going to decrease that affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen and cause an unloading of oxygen from the blood into the tissues. So we use the term hypoxia to indicate low oxygen. Whenever we have insufficient oxygen to meet the demands of our metabolic metabolism in our tissues, we call that hypoxia. So some reasons for that can be insufficient red blood cell production. It can be abnormal hemoglobin or not enough hemoglobin. It could be because of some clot in the circulatory system that's preventing blood flow. Um, met certain metabolic poisons can cause hypoxia. Any disease that is occurring in the lungs, preventing airflow, something affecting the, the respiratory membrane, and carbon monoxide. In lab, we talked about how carbon monoxide has a high affinity for binding to hemoglobin greater than oxygen. So carbon monoxide essentially kicks off the oxygen and replaces and, and binds to hemoglobin. Well, we can't use that carbon monoxide to oxygenate our tissues, so that's going to result in hypoxia. But again, if someone has carbon monoxide poisoning, they're going to have a normal oxygen saturation because the hemoglobin is bound, but it's just bound to the wrong thing. It's bound to carbon monoxide rather than oxygen. Carbon dioxide now is transported in three different ways. Dissolved in the plasma, just like we saw with oxygen, and then 20% is bound to hemoglobin. So hemoglobin doesn't just bind oxygen, it also binds carbon dioxide. And then a majority of the carbon dioxide is transported as bicarbonate ions in the plasma. So it forms this HCO3 minus, this bicarbonate ion in the plasma. And this is a result of a chemical reaction that occurs in red blood cells. We talked a little bit about that reaction when we talked about um, hydrochloric acid production in the digestive system using that carbonic anhydrase and forming carbonic acid. So if we look at that formula a little closely, more closely, we can see that carbon dioxide present in the blood with water, we know water is a large component of our plasma, that combines to form carbonic acid. And that carbonic acid, in turn, will dissociate into the ions that formed from the carbon dioxide and water, and that's hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion. So this happens in the red blood cell. This reaction is occurring in the red blood cell, and the enzyme that creates, or I'm sorry, that forms and breaks down this carbonic acid is carbonic anhydrase. So this is a reversible reaction and depending on the needs of the body this reaction can be pushed to the right or to the left. So a majority of bicarbonate ion is the result or is uh, transported as bicarbonate ion. And if we look at that bicarbonate ion that is formed in the red blood cells it quickly diffuses into the plasma and remember that chloride ion moves in as a result of the loss of that negative charge. That creates a, a, a gradient for chloride then to enter the red blood cell. So here is that reaction that we saw um, in the digestive system.
We see carbon dioxide is constantly being produced by the tissue cells entering the interstitial fluid, so we see a strong concentration gradient there. Some of that carbon dioxide will remain dissolved in the plasma. Some will enter into the red blood cell. We can see there's a large arrow, so that means the majority is going to enter into the red blood cell. And this reaction, with the help of carbonic anhydrase inside the red blood cell, is going to produce bicarbonate ion. And that's where we find most of the carbon dioxide produced by the tissues, released to the interstitial fluid, enters that red blood cell and becomes bicarbonate ion that will be free-floating out in the plasma. So looking at this exchange between the capillaries and the alveoli, again we talked about the importance of the red blood cell and that carbon dioxide is going to diffuse from the pulmonary capillaries into the alveoli. So up here in the lungs now, we can see that bicarbonate ion, again, is that bicarbonate ion enters into the red blood cell, participates in this reaction, and that carbon dioxide that is formed from the breakdown of, or from the, first of all, the forming of carbonic acid, then the breakdown of that, and that is released into the lungs. So we have a forming of bicarbonate out in the tissues and a, and a reverse reaction occurring up in the lungs, so we can release that carbon dioxide and we can blow off that CO2 in the alveoli. So it's just the reverse reaction in the lungs where we see the release of the carbon dioxide. So the Haldane effect talks about the influence of oxygen levels and how it affects the affinity of hemoglobin to bind carbon dioxide. So essentially, if we have low oxygen levels in the blood, that's going to increase the affinity for hemoglobin to bind carbon dioxide. Because again, we know that these two gases are linked. When oxygen levels are low, carbon dioxide levels are likely to be high. So the Haldane effect is looking at the levels of oxygen in the blood and how that affects the binding of hemoglobin for carbon dioxide. The inverse is true when we look at the Bohr effect. The Bohr effect is looking at carbon dioxide levels in the blood and how that affects the binding of oxygen. So if we have increased carbon dioxide levels in the blood because of metabolically active tissues or um, again decreased breathing up at the alveoli, then we're going to see a decreased affinity for hemoglobin to bind oxygen so we can promote the unloading of oxygen into the tissues. So the Bohr effect is using carbon dioxide levels in the blood to impact the affinity of oxygen and hemoglobin, and the Haldane effect is using oxygen levels in the blood to affect the affinity of hemoglobin for carbon dioxide. Again, both are related. So if we look at um, this carbon dioxide and the ability of it to create bicarbonate ion, that can serve as a buffer for pH. So what we find is if the hydrogen ion concentration in the blood is rising because of some condition, say um, lactic acid buildup in the muscles, we, that excess hydrogen ion can be picked up by the bicarbonate ion and that's going to raise our pH. It essentially removes that hydrogen ion from the blood and removes its influence on pH. The same thing can happen if we see a, uh, a drop in hydrogen ion concentration, if there's some type of alkalosis going on in the blood. What we find is this carbonic acid, which is not influencing the pH because it's still bound, it will dissociate into its two ions of H plus and HCO3 and that's going to release excess hydrogen ion into the environment and that's going to raise pH. So carbonic acid is an, is an excellent buffer for pH changes in the blood and we'll talk more about that at the end of the semester when we specifically look at acid-base imbalances in the lab section. So we know that carbon dioxide is carried by the blood off to the lungs and we get rid of excess carbon dioxide in the blood through the alveoli, through exhalation. But if we're not breathing effectively, if we're not exhaling that carbon dioxide off into the lungs, that carbon dioxide accumulates in the blood and it causes 
Again, that dissociation to occur, releasing hydrogen ion into the blood and dropping pH. So anytime we have lower breathing, hypoventilation, we're at risk for rising PCO2 and dropping pH and acidosis would result. So controlling this process of respiration involves the brain. Neurons from the reticular formation of the medulla and pons. So the key parts of the brain that control breathing is the brain stem, specifically the medulla and the pons. There is, um, there's two groups of neurons. And if we look at specifically the, the primary um, control of breathing, so looking at the external intercostals and the diaphragm, that's what we need for quiet breathing. That initial impulse um, we can see is in the, the medulla, but the pons influences that uh, rate of breathing. So the pons is essentially a helper to the medulla in controlling the respiratory rate, but the primary impulse for respiration is generated by the medulla. So we know um, that back and forth, inhalation, exhalation, is the result of the palms, but the primary control of breathing is at the level of the medulla. So there's other things, though, that can, that can influence the rate in which we breathe, so the amount of ventilation that is occurring. So we know that um, anytime we have a decrease in pH or an increase in PCO2, that can stimulate other um, receptors outside of the brain and that would be in the carotid arch I'm sorry the the carotid arteries have chemoreceptors that are measuring the amount of um, carbon dioxide dissolved in the blood and in the aorta so the carotid and aortic bodies are they have chemoreceptors that are detecting the amount of uh, P carbon dioxide in the blood and we have chemoreceptors in the medulla that respond to hydrogen ion, which is a result of carbon dioxide. So when we look at influences in the blood that drive breathing, it's the amount of carbon dioxide, and as a result of that increase in carbon dioxide, we see excess hydrogen ion, and that is going to stimulate increased ventilation. So acidic conditions are going to um, drive that ventilation and the uh, synapsing of that impulse on the diaphragm and external intercostals. So when we look at depth and rate of breathing, again, um, high carbon dioxide levels um, are going to cause an acidotic situation in the blood, but looking at hyperventilation, um, excess breathing, excess exhalation, that can drop carbon dioxide levels and cause a rise in pH, which we call alkalosis. And that can be a very serious condition because it causes the vessels to constrict um, that serve the brain and that can cause someone to pass out. So it's very important that we reverse that um, low carbon dioxide in the blood due to the rapid breathing and sometimes we have people breathe into a brown paper bag to, to increase the carbon dioxide levels in the blood and reverse that rising pH. And um, when we have very low carbon dioxide levels, there's nothing to stimulate the breathing process and we get what we call apnea. You've heard of sleep apnea. That happens um, to some people at nighttime when they're sleeping, but when we don't have enough carbon dioxide to drive respirations, we end up with apnea or no stimulation of those, breathe, those muscles for quiet breathing. So if we look at the influence of oxygen on breathing, we find that it's not the direct um, controller of breathing because because of the influence of hemoglobin and the unloading that can occur we don't see uh, an increase in ventilation until that PO2 drops to 60 millimeters of mercury so that's quite a significant drop before we see an increase in ventilation but we see a much more significant um, influence of breathing on small changes in carbon dioxide levels so here's just an example of where we find the chemoreceptors in the carotid arteries that are detecting ca um, carbon dioxide levels. So we see that in the carotid arteries and also in the aortic arch. We find these chemoreceptors that are sensory receptors that are going to stimulate um, increased ventilation.
Again, where do these neurons go? They serve the medulla and the pons. So again, looking at pH, anytime we have a drop in pH, uh, we can think of carbon dioxide. It's a result of carbon dioxide being retained because of there's uh, lung damage. It might be accumulation of lactic acid. There's excessive muscle activity that we might see with a seizure, for example. Um, or people with diabetes, that there's too much blood, too much sugar in the blood, but not in the tissues. <clears throat> then the body is reverting to uh, keto acids for en um, energy. It's breaking down fat and muscle, releasing keto acids. That's part of the Krebs cycle. We talked about that a little bit. Some of those um, other molecules produced along the way. Um, if there's insufficient sugar, we see this switch to this keto ketosis. And then we see um, acid conditions in the body. So that's going to drop pH. And again, the, the respiratory system can detect that um, low pH. And that is going to stimulate an increase in the respiratory rate and depth of breathing. So key concept, it's carbon dioxide levels that are the most powerful stimulant of the respiratory rate. And normal blood PO2 only acts indirectly by influencing those chemoreceptors, um, influencing their sensitivity to changes in carbon dioxide levels. So the carbon dioxide levels are the primary driver of breathing. So when those, that PO2 drops to less than 60, then it overrides the PCO2 and it will drive the ventilation rate. But again, it has to drop significantly because normally the normal PO2 is about 100 in the arterial blood. So a drop from 100 to 60 is pretty significant before we see an increase in ventilation. So if we look at other influences on the breathing rate, obviously if we um, get some really bad news, we can um, override the respiratory rate with our emotions. People deep breathe, stick to hyperventilate with really good news or really bad news. That can cause them to pass out. So that's going to increase the respiratory rate. When we raise the body temperature, like I said, that's going to increase the respiratory rate. So when you look at a child with a fever, you'll notice that they're breathing a little bit more rapidly. That's just the body's response to the increase in temperature. Um, we can override, obviously, the medulla's influence on breathing when we hold our breath. So that is a way to, again, the higher brain centers overriding that automatic um, stimulation of the breathing muscles by the medulla. Um, looking at irritants, we have um, receptors in the lungs and the airways particularly in the airways, that when stimulated, some debris enters into the airways, it's going to cause a violent coughing or sneezing reflex. That's just the body's way of responding. So anytime there's irritants, it's going to stimulate the, the respiratory system to contract those, stimulate the medulla to contract those respiratory muscles and expel that inhaled irritant. So looking at this diagram here, we can just see you know, positive influences on breathing um, such as decreased oxygen, increased carbon dioxide, increased hydrogen ion. Um, when we move our joints and muscles, that stimulates the proprioceptors. Um, increased movement there is going to stimulate breathing and cause an increase in the respiratory rate. But when we stretch the lung to a maximal capacity, that's going to inhibit breathing so we don't overinflate the lungs. And irritants are going to stop the inhalation process so we don't further inhale something into our lungs. You'll notice if you start to inhale something, it initiates a violent coughing response. It's going to stop that inhalation process once irritants um, are detected in those receptors of the airways. So what we find, um, a patients often come in with lung disease. Most common cause of that is tobacco smoke or exposure to environmental particles in the air at their workplace. Oftentimes, farmer's lung is a significant um, cause of lung disease here in our area. So it's really important to tell young farmers to wear a mask when they're baling hay or dealing with a lot of airborne debris because chronic exposure of that lung tissue to that airborne debris <coughs> can cause long-term permanent <coughs> damage. So bronchitis is just inflammation of the airways. <coughs> 
leading to asthma and a chronic cough. And emphysema, we said, is a destruction of the walls of the alveoli, so air gets trapped in the lungs and there is no surface tension. There's nothing to collapse the lungs because there is, are no alveoli. All we have is the connective tissue of the lungs, which are attached to the thorax. So when we have patients come in, it's important that we understand the role of not only oxygen in the blood, when it comes to the respiratory system, but also of carbon dioxide. So when we see patients that are have low ventilation, we need to think about the influence of rising carbon dioxide levels on the blood and make sure we address that just as seriously as we do with low oxygen levels.